All right. Welcome, everyone. Uh, welcome to Revolution 613. In their introduction to the classic and seminal collection of critical race theory writings, critical race theory, the key writings that formed the movement, Kendall Thomas and his colleagues write, this is actually the last sentence of their introduction. It is our hope that the writings collected here will prove to be a useful critical compass for negotiating the treacherous terrain of American racial politics in the coming century. Treacherous indeed. Who would have imagined back then in the 1990s that these writings in critical race theory would not only be a critical compass for so many of us, but also the target of a massive nationwide presidential-led misinformation campaign with the mission of eradicating critical race theory and more broadly race consciousness from our language, from our public debates, from our consciousness. Who would have imagined that instead of enriching the national conversation on race, a US president and political leaders from Congress all the way to local school boards would target these ideas and place them at the very bullseye of our culture wars. Racial politics can do that. Stuart Hall argued that race and racial discourse, he was referring specifically in this passage here provocatively to biological and genetic racial discourse. He said, racial discourse is not a form of truth in any case, he said, but rather a regime of truth. And he said, it is through its discursive operations that race gives meaning to the world, makes a certain kind of sense to the world, constructs an order of intelligibility, organizes human practices within its categories, and thus comes to acquire real effects. Race, in his words, is a sliding signifier. I would argue that critical race theory, as a result of the attacks, is no longer simply a set of writings and theoretical interventions, but has become as well a sliding signifier, a discursive operation that for many now has come to mean something much more broad than the original critical race theory, something akin now to any form of race consciousness. And as a result, it is now a discursive formation that gives meaning to the world we live in, in Hall's terms. My hope, my ambition, my prayer for tonight is that our discussion will help to productively push those meanings of critical race theory and of racial discourse in this country and help to productively organize our practices so that they have real effects. Now, the history of the assault over the past year on critical race theory is well known, and I've recapped it in the second introductory post on the blog, and I won't recount it here because it doesn't deserve any more airtime. I'd prefer us to focus our time and shared intellectual space on both the response to the assault on critical race theory and or to pushing critical race theory forward, enriching the theoretical debate with our own constructive contributions. We have set out some preliminary thoughts in our introductory posts and uh, set forth a few questions to help guide our discussion. Should critical theorists reclaim the discourse of critical race theory and take back CRT in the way in which perhaps the term queer was reclaimed by queer theory? Or should critical theorists shift semantic fields and let go of the term in order to invent other new ways of speaking and seeing the world? Should they confront the assault or ignore it and instead keep theorizing? And if so, how? To address those questions, I could think of no one better suited than my dearest colleague, the brilliant Kendall Thomas, uh, to help guide us. Uh, in conversation, of course, with some remarkable texts by Stuart Hall and Manning Maribel. Welcome, Kendall, and thanks for joining us. Uh, let me give a quick introduction, even though you need no introduction here at home at the Columbia Center for Contemporary Critical Thought. Kendall Thomas, the Nash Professor of Law at Columbia University, is one of the founders of critical race theory, and as noted earlier, the co-editor of the seminal collection, Critical Race Theory, the Key Writings That Formed the Movement. 
He has been instrumental in developing critical race theory and also helping to push critical race theory into new areas of gender and sexuality, of racial capitalism, of neoliberalism, cultural studies, and post-structuralism. Kendall Thomas has been a leading voice in response to the assault on critical race theory. <clears throat> he recently delivered the uh, 2020 Equality and Diversity Lecture at Oxford University. We've posted that as a link on the blog. Uh, and so you can see it there as well as an earlier essay on the question of racial justice. Kendall Thomas is the director of the Center for the Study of Law and Culture at Columbia, a center that is inspired in many ways by the cultural studies approach that Stuart Hall pioneered in the UK. And it explores how the law operates as one of the central ways to create meaning in society. He's also a founder of Amend the 13th, a movement to amend the United States Constitution to end the prison exception to slavery. Kendall Thomas has written and spoken widely on the impact of AIDS and was a founding member of the Majority Action Caucus of ACT UP, Sex Panic, and the AIDS Prevention Action League. He's a former board member of the Gay Men's Health Crisis and now serves on the board of the New York City AIDS Memorial. I should add that Kendall Thomas is also an extraordinary professional jazz vocalist uh, who performs at venues, uh, including Joe's Pub down at the Public Theater. Now in the introductory post, I also uh, made a short presentation of Stuart Hall and Manning Marable, uh, whose work we'll be discussing, but I'm gonna stop here with introductions and turn the mic over to Kendall Thomas. Welcome. Thank you very much, Bernard. It's a pleasure to be here with you in the 1313 Revolutions seminar. Uh, I wish we could be together, but it's always notwithstanding <clears throat> the intense effort to naturalize and normalize this moment, worth remarking that these are extraordinary times, uh, these pandemic times. Mm -hmm. And uh, the fact that we are not seated around a table at the Heyman Center, uh, a table of which I have many fond memories of intellectual communion is a source of sadness. Uh, and I hope that we will soon be able to gather safely, perhaps even without masks, uh, for the intellectual feasts that you have prepared for us now these several years and which have been such an important part of the life of the mind uh, and of the practice of knowledge production, not just at Columbia, not just in New York, not just in the United States, but globally, the global reach of the work that has been undertaken by the learning community you have assembled in these seminars is important and uh, has been transformative, certainly uh, for me. I have not prepared a formal text in the spirit of a seminar. I really do want uh, to be able to have a discussion. Uh, I am, um, even as we speak, manipulating texts and documents from which I want to read. I had actually just found a text. Here it is. Uh, this is not a text that was assigned, but uh, I thought it might be a way into the discussion. I'm going to focus principally on the texts by and the ideas raised in the writing of Stuart Hall, uh, which is dense and rich and paradigm defining for our thinking about revolution, about counter-revolution and the way stations on the road to both. This is from a little essay that appeared in a 1990 collection entitled Identity, colon, 
community, cultural, culture, difference, identity, community, culture, difference. And the title of the essay by Stuart Hall is Cultural Identity and Diaspora. And I just want to read uh, a few lines from that essay. Identity is not as transparent or unproblematic as we think. Perhaps instead of thinking of identity as an already accomplished fact, which the new cultural practices then represent, we should think instead of identity as a production, which is never complete, always in process, and always constituted within, not outside, representation. Uh, those of you who know Stuart Hall's writing know that this category of representation is absolutely central uh, to his work. Hall goes on to say, this view problemizes the very authority and authenticity to which the term cultural identity lays claim. And then this next uh, paragraph actually is the one that I wanted to share. We seek here to open a dialogue an investigation on the subject of cultural identity and representation. Of course, the I who writes here must also be thought of as itself enunciated. We all write and speak from a particular place in time, from a history and a culture which is specific. What we say is always in context, positioned. I was born into and spent my childhood and adolescence in a lower middle class family in Jamaica. I have lived all my adult life in England in the shadow of the black diaspora, in the belly of the beast. I write against the background of a, lifetime, a lifetime's work in cultural studies. If the paper seems preoccupied with the diaspora experience and its narratives of displacement it is worth remembering that all discourse is placed and the heart has its reasons. If the paper seems preoccupied with the diaspora experience, this is a, a man born in Jamaica writing, but who spent all of his adult life in England and its narratives of displacement, it is worth remembering that all discourse is placed and that the heart has its reasons. So I read these lines to mark my own position uh, in the history of what has come to be known as critical race theory. And I do so uh, largely because uh, this year for me is uh, a momentous one uh, in my life history, I will be uh, shortly registering for Medicare. And uh, I cannot help but look back across the decades uh, when in my 30s, I collaborated with Kimberly Crenshaw, Neil Gotanda and Gary Peller in producing the Critical Race Theory Reader that was published by the New Press. Um, I have very specific memories, not only of the production of that text, but of the meetings uh, that led up to the publication of that text, which took place over the course of the late 80s into the early 90s, first in workshops and later in conferences, and which were absolutely crucial to my intellectual and professional formation. Uh, I could never have imagined, and I don't think anyone who was at those early workshops and conferences could ever have imagined uh, that the terms critical race theory and the deformation of the scholarship associated with critical race theory would occupy such a central place in American political life, would be both uh, a site and a tool 
for the weaponization of race and racial discourse uh, in US power politics. And so we are discussing this body of largely theoretical work, which was a response to a specific moment in the history of American law and American legal institutions in a setting that was very different than the one in which this work originally emerged. And that I think needs to be remarked uh, because we wrote about questions of power and politics at a remove uh, from an institutional location, the university, uh, which had not yet become itself uh, a battleground uh, of power politics. And critical race theory really was a theoretical or scholarly response to and a reflection of a very specific set of disciplinary and institutional realities, all of which really centered around the language of law and rights. So the problem to which critical race theory responded was one in which we all found ourselves in the 80s. Certainly by the end of the second term of the Reagan presidency, which Edward Said uh, famously called in his audiences, opponents and constituencies essay, the age of Reagan. So the horizons of that period uh, and the sea change that the Reagan presidency represented in the very terms of American political discourse and the unapologetic repudiation of the vision of the civil rights movement that was forged in the United States in the 50s and 60s was the ground out of which critical race theory emerged. Now, we wrote at a time when the civil rights re revolution had seemed to have been consolidated in the Supreme Court, uh, certainly in the period starting in 1954 with the decision in Brown versus the Board of Education, but had already begun to unravel, uh, starting with the 1978 Supreme Court decision in University of California Regents versus Bakke, uh, the first and in many ways, uh, the most decisive of the early affirmative action cases. And so the civil rights settlement uh, which had been ratified by the courts, uh, undertaken in part by the courts, but um, um, also by legislatures, the civil rights settlement, which had uh, appeared to install as a central normative and doctrinal plank, the notion uh, of anti-discrimination, uh, and some version of formal equality was, it became pretty clear to us, failing to do the work and, and to achieve the transformations uh, which had been promised. Uh, and we felt that our obligation as people in the first generation really, uh, at least in significant numbers of legal intellectuals of color in US law schools was to try to develop a theory of that failure. Right? Why is it uh, that these legal rules and doctrines and principles 
of equality, of neutrality, um, and the like, had failed to secure, to make real, materially, right, uh, the promise of the civil rights revolution that had relied on so, uh, in so many ways, on law and the language of rights, uh, both as a, a tool and an arena for the Black freedom struggle. Right? Uh, and it was this failure of civil rights uh, and indeed of uh, the appeal to the state and a reliance on statist politics, on legalism uh, that really, uh, I think, explained the emergence of what would come to be known as critical race theory at the time it emerged. Right? Uh, it was in the language of a well-known article by Kimberly Crenshaw, uh, a moment in which we saw the retrenchment of the reformist impulse uh, that the civil rights movement was an expression of uh, and that appeared uh, to be consolidated uh, as a settlement, uh, as a settlement of civil rights. So uh, we were writing at the beginning of what we now come to uh, know, which we would eventually come to know, uh, was the end really of the age of civil rights. The age of Reagan ushered in the beginning of the end of the age of civil rights. And our writing was an effort in part to make sense of that shattering institutional ideological development. And so critical race theory engages with the question of law and with the language of rights and the limits of the language of uh, rights and law, but it is at base a theory of power. Okay? Uh, and it is a theory of power that is rooted in an understanding uh, that racial power and perhaps all power uh, has its sources and its effects outside the state uh, and notably in culture, right? in the domain of culture. Uh, so the central insight uh, of critical race theory was that race is not just a social construction, a thesis uh, with which critical race theory uh, is associated most notably because of the work of Ian Haney Lopez and his book, uh, White by Law, uh, nor indeed is race uh, just a cultural construction in the sense that it's simply about um, the semiotic dimension of social life. Right? Uh, the recognition was that culture is a site for and a resource in the exercise of racial power in ways that are independent of, exceed, and indeed have their origins outside of the state, right? uh, the formal institutions of the state and outside of formal legal ideology. Uh, so culture matters to politics. And so we reject it. Uh, the notion, uh, still popular in some circles, that our attention to culture was a substitute uh, for attention to politics, specifically to the politics of law, because we understood that culture is power and that law is a cultural form right? and that law very much relies in its ideological dimensions on ways of, uh, of, of viewing and talking about the world 
that cannot be understood solely in nor reduced to the language of law alone. Uh, if you want to understand race law, we argue, you have to be willing to step outside law and to draw on other discourses that are not the internal uh, discourses of law and on perspectives that are not the internal uh, perspective of law. Um, and that move, uh, a move which in many ways is still contested, was made possible in large part because of the emergence, which was coincident with critical race theory of cultural studies, whose institutionalization, Stuart Hall has remarked this himself, whose institutionalization in the United States as compared, for example, to uh, the United Kingdom, uh, took place with a rapidity uh, and a thoroughness, which in many ways is utterly, utterly stunning, right? And so I wanna argue uh, that there's something like a, a, a constitutive connection, at least on the side of, of critical race theory, between the understanding of critical race theory that race law had to be understood by seeing it simultaneously as a site for the practice of power uh, and as a cultural form, right? Uh, the co-constitution of that view and uh, cultural studies, right? Uh, so Hall's great insight uh, that race is not just a signifier, but a sliding signifier, right? Uh, is enabled by the focus in cultural studies on the concept of discourse and the interrogation of the discursive dimensions of social life that cultural studies with its focus on uh, practices of representation placed at the center of its intellectual project. Uh, and it was this understanding of race as a sliding signifier uh, that led me uh, to argue that we should cease to see race as a noun and understand race as a verb, right? So if race is a sliding signifier, it's a particular kind of slide, sliding signifier, right? Um, whose force is to be understood not so much in the personality of, uh, or, or the personhood of the subjects that race law uh, governs, but rather in the practices through which uh, race uh, as an ideology and as an institution for the administration of and distribution, material distribution of rights, right? Uh, lives and moves uh, and has its being, right? So um, in this regard, um, we might say uh, that the understanding of critical race theory uh, on the ways in which law did not just elaborate and apply rules, announce principles of rights-based governance right, and validate or invalidate the exercise of state action, but produced discursively both the state, the law, and the subjects, uh, the racial state, right? the race law and the racial subjects that the law was merely claiming right? uh, and, and, and courts in particular were merely claiming to be a dispute uh, 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 re re resolver for, right? Right? that this involved the active, the active work to use Hall's uh, famous formulation uh, and definition of representation, the active work, the labor, uh, he rather provocatively said, of making things mean. And so this connection between race, law, culture, mediated right, 
by the concept or by particular uh, discursive conception of power right, is for me an important part of uh, the work that made critical race theory possible, even for people uh, who were not particularly literate in uh, the then uh, and still, uh, although perhaps less so fashionable, uh, theoretical uh, 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 literatures that had crossed uh, the Atlantic uh, from Europe uh, in the name of uh, folks like Jacques Derrida, Michel Foucault, Jacques Lacan. Uh, many of us received that work through cultural studies and many of us received cultural studies through Stuart Hall right? uh, and through Hall's focus on and elaboration of uh, uh, the, 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 the procedures and preoccupations of cultural studies uh, in and through attention to race, right? And the, a very rich set of writings, um, the writings on Thatcher uh, and New Times, uh, the, the writings on policing, right? Uh, and um, let's see, I have the book here. Uh, policing the crisis, right? uh, and all this really rich work which came out of the Birmingham School uh, under the tutelage of the generation of British intellectuals like Stuart Hall, uh, who had trained with uh, people like Raymond Williams, uh, Levis, uh, and others, uh, and who were really um, the children of the Windrush uh, uh, generation. So I actually, I actually was introduced to Stuart Hall through my friendship with uh, the artists who were part of the Sankofa Collective, John Akumfra, Isaac Julian, right, who were young filmmakers uh, whom I met in 1983, 84, 45, somewhere around there during the time of uh, the important work they were doing like Hansworth songs and the like. And so I came to cultural studies through arts and, and the humanities and was primed, right, uh, consequently, uh, to connect that work to the reading that I had done uh, as a young law student um, at Yale, where in addition to my courses in the law school, I spent a lot of time uh, reading and, and studying uh, people like Frederick Jameson, Paul Demon, uh, Jacques Derrida, and thinking about the ways in which the law could be understood through the language of language and through the lens of discourse. Right? So that was a that was a specific moment, and cultural studies was my introduction uh, to that. Uh, and um, so. Um, This cultural turn um, is part of both the discursive and the ideological field that created the conditions of possibility for the emergence of what we would come to know as identity politics, right? uh, which found its first fruits and flowering actually in the domain of culture. Um, as can be seen from the title is escaping me this uh, this this marvelous uh, documentary on um, the, was it called the Summer of Soul, which came out this past summer, uh, of found archival footage of the famous concerts that took place in Marcus Garvey Park, right here in Harlem. Um, uh, Questlove produced it, uh, and so the arts and the culture uh, of that moment, like the arts and the culture of the, 19, the late 1960s uh, that surrounded me when I grew up uh, in Northern California uh, and was mesmerized by the culture that was coming out of uh, the community uh, in, in Oakland, near where I grew up, um, around the Black Panthers. Right? So th these cultural formations were absolutely uh, crucial building blocks 
of and for what would come to be identity politics. Say it loud, I'm black and I'm proud, right? Uh, and so culture matters in ways uh, for critical race theory that distinguishes radically both um, uh, in terms of its method uh, and of its engagement, uh, engagements at the intersection of law and culture in ways that I, 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 would, I would wanna stress here. And, and um, inform uh, the understanding of race as a site and tool of power, um, that is of race as a politics in ways that I don't think would have been possible, right, otherwise. So uh, we were poised then uh, to develop a language that would respond to two competing accounts, um, both of which uh, had in important respects as their aim, a desire to demonstrate that race doesn't, didn't, or at least ideally shouldn't matter, right? Uh, and I mean here to refer on the one side um, to liberal legalism, right? Uh, which was organized principally around a notion of race as a moral question, race and racism as moral questions uh, that involved a kind of moral error committed principally uh, by individuals in the context of discrete events or episodes uh, and that were governed by a view of our co-citizens okay, that was distorted by racial prejudice. Okay. Uh, so in the liberal parlance, uh, the moral error of racism is called discrimination. Okay. And it consists in the refusal to see and respect the moral personhood of persons who, to use a phrase I, as a junior faculty member, heard more than one uh, faculty meeting uh, in discussions of prospective faculty candidates, persons who happen to be black, right? So uh, it's a humanism of sorts, um, um, and it's anchored in a kind of universalism, uh, which sees the accidents of race uh, like those of sex, uh, uh, religion, right? ethnicity, right? as incidental, inconsequential, and contingent features of a human personality, right? which is not encumbered in any way, right? and whose essential identity is not defined by these accidents of birth. Uh, so that was the moral, uh, the racial, what I've come in my, uh, come to call in my own writing, the racial moralism uh, of, 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 um, of uh, liberalism. And on the other side, uh, critical race theory had to do battle with a certain kind of uh, um, left uh, ideological uh, perspective uh, in which race didn't matter because a focus on race distorted and diverted our attention from what really mattered, namely class. Right? So what defined the left perspective with which many of the folks in critical legal studies, as it was called, cast their lot, right? 
was this notion that race was an epiphenomenon of class right? and that a focus on race was distracting us from attention to uh, the real origins right? uh, and side of operation of social uh, precarity and privation, namely the economy. Um, now, critical race theory, as I said, uh, offered another paradigm or frame, which focused not on morality, right? which focused not on the economism of class uh, and a privileging, particularly in particular, of, of, of something called the working class, right, or labor. Um, but on this question of power and on the ways in which culture uh, and in particular the culture of race was, not re was distinct from and not reducible to liberalism's abstract moral personhood and the, the, the abstract language of liberal universalism, right? uh, in which the subject of politics was the individual, right? nor uh, the, uh, the equally abstract uh, universalism of the class perspective of the neo-Marxist uh, who were uh, so central to the formation of critical legal studies. And what I want to suggest mostly, um, so that's one point. And the second point is uh, critical race theory understood in a way that in my experience, neither um, liberal legal intellectuals nor left legal intellectuals understood that, and here I'm going to quote uh, the great sociologist Alvin Guldner, that the individuality of theory work is a socially sanctioned uh, illusion. Right? Uh, Guldner famously noted that um, all theory is not merely influenced but produced by a group. Right? And that intellectual understanding, that epistemic commitment to a mode of knowledge production, which understood itself uh, as a collective uh, project was firmly rooted, right? Uh, and uh, grew out of critical race theory's recognition of the importance of group existence right? and the linked fate of people who were defined by their racialization. Right? And so um, this sense of, of um, the group Communitarian, um, and I'm using that word um, somewhat reluctantly, but it, it does the work I wanted wanted to do here. Uh, roots of this work was another contribution. I think a really important contribution uh, of critical race theory, uh, which reflected critical race theory's engagement. Uh, with uh, legal feminism or the, uh, the expressions of legal feminism that were rooted in, uh, for example, uh, um, considerations of culture right? and, and uh, the, the practices of the feminist movement that were so central uh, in the 60s of uh, consciousness raising and coming into consciousness on the part of women of uh, their linked fate, to use Michael Dawson's phrase. Right? Uh, and um, I see uh, the current moment uh, through that lens and, and the dilemma that critical race theory faces, um, it seems to me um, is one which I think is brilliantly 
described by Wendy Brown in her important book, States uh, of Injury, uh, in the chapter on wounded attachments, right? uh, where she notes the ways in which on one side, uh, liberalism, right? uh, and on the other side, um, disciplinary regimes right? take up the language of identity right? um, and use the language of identity either to convert it into interests, right? Um, or use the language of identity uh, to accommodate it uh, to individualism right? and naturalize it uh, in a way that accommodates it to or reconciles it to uh, bourgeois understandings of the subject, bourgeois understandings of rights, and to actually existing uh, power structures, um, not least capitalism. Right? Um, and you know, so this notion of uh, of political race, to use Lonnie Gounier and Gerald Torres's phrase, uh, is very important to me uh, because uh, it reflects an understanding in Gounier and Torres's formulation that political race is neither an identity politics nor a class politics. Uh, that it's about the collective interaction at the individual group and institutional uh, levels uh, of group interactions that reflect on and engage with questions of power and relations of power, and which understands uh, that race is not just a cultural, not just a social, but a political construct. Uh, Neil Gotanda famously uh, wrote an article published in Stanford Law Review in 1990 that there were four types of race that are reflected in the history of uh, our constitutional equality jurisprudence. Status race, historical race, formal race, and culture race. Guineer and Torres added a fifth, political race. Uh, and I think that uh, that term uh, is an important lens for uh, us to address the current moment, uh, a moment which I see as one in which we have uh, perhaps uh, reached uh, the end right, of the work that um, the language of racial identity can do for us um, I'm not saying, and hope I won't be misunderstood as suggesting uh, that notions of racial identity have been utterly without value and that we did not need uh, racial identity to achieve much of the political and intellectual work uh, that we've achieved. But I think we're at a moment where a sober, serious look at our political and intellectual landscape forces us to the conclusion uh, that the notions of identity, of racial identity that once served as an indispensable tool uh, at one historical moment in anti-racist struggle have now become unwitting traps. Right? Um, there's a marvelous book published a couple of years ago by uh, Daniel Martinez Hosang and Joseph uh, Loundis called Producers, Parasites, and Patriots, Race and the New Right-Wing Politics of, of Precarity, uh, which gives us a really thick description of something that was first noticed many years ago uh, by Cindy Patton, of the ways in which the language of identity and strategies of identity politics have been taken up by white right-wing uh, uh, opponents of racial justice right? and have been deployed to delegitimize and do battle with the very identity politics uh, that decades ago seemed uh, so crucial to the struggle 
uh, for racial justice in the United States. And um, when I put that analysis together with the conceptual critical analysis of someone like uh, Wendy Brown about the ways in which liberalism uh, absorbs kind of aufgehoben, right? Uh, these notions of identity and puts them to uses uh, that are utterly at odds with uh, the libertarian emancipatory impulses that um, uh, gave birth to them. Uh, I think, you know, we have to think in terms of um, the dynamic character of politics and the fact that politics always takes place in a particular situation. This is the insight for me of the, uh, the Hall lecture on cultural struggle and resistance, right? He says, uh, we would be wrong to dismiss to court the value and validity of the idea of rights just because uh, the notion of liberal rights had its origins in the bourgeois revolution. Uh, there's work that rights can do uh, that is important and indispensable to more transformative political projects. Right? Uh, and it's, it's Hall's notion of articulation. Right? Uh, so we can disarticulate rights from the bourgeois revolution and from uh, the, the containment of the social, uh, uh, the, the will to social transformation uh, that the bourgeois revolution represented uh, and the management of class uh, uh, conflict and, and, and uh, um, antagonism uh, that the bourgeois revolution was meant to kind of stem uh, and, or stanch and put it to use it, right? So I've, I've, I myself have argued that doctrinal formulations that appear to be conservative on their face that have originated in the courts can be put to radical use. But it is also true that notions that once served a radical impulse can be re-articulated, right? Harnessed to projects that are hostile to uh, the progressive emancipatory projects uh, that originally gave voice to an enunciation to them. And it's, it's that I see as uh, the principal value of both the terms and the modes and methods of uh, critical cultural analysis uh, that Stuart Hall gave us in his writings, right? Uh, cultural forms are being constantly appropriated, expropriated, reworked. Right? Uh, representations of identity, of power, of politics, of state, of law, of rights, right? uh, are constantly being produced, reproduced, rearticulated, disarticulated in ways that require a labile, dynamic, flexible understandings right? of the sliding signifier of race and of the dependence of that sliding figure uh, signifier on discourses and signifiers that are adjacent to it right? uh, and in and through which it is lived. Right? Uh, and that understanding I think is crucial uh, to understanding, to, to, to grasping uh, this moment uh, in which we find ourselves uh, and in thinking about uh, a different kind of politics uh, which is focused not on who we are, right? Uh, there's something profoundly wrong with the state of our understanding of and the, the language we use to talk about race in the United States, in particular today, when you can have a right-wing uh, politician like Tim Scott and a liberal progressive politician uh, like Kamala Harris, both agreeing that the baseline from which we should think, talk, and address, uh, uh, talk about and address questions of racial justice in the United States is a proposition that the United States is not a racist country, right? which totally uh, takes the air out of and forecloses a conversation of, a, of the, the even more urgent question, what practices would we have to undertake in the United States for the United States to be not merely uh, not a racist country, but an anti-racist country. Right? Um, and I wanna suggest that this focus uh, in former President Obama's uh, well-known formulation on who we are, right, shows the ways in which 
the language of identity and a certain understanding of identity and the political uh, uses of, 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 of uh, identitarian uh, discourses has totally saturated and occupied the social uh, formation right? in ways that demand uh, fresh thinking. Right? Um, and um, I think that essential work is work that demands us to re-engage with uh, questions of power, um, of racial power, but also to think about these questions of racial power um, in ways that are alert to and that do not flinch from engaging uh, with uh, the limits of race, right? As a language for understanding the practices, material and ideological practices that sustain relations of racial uh, injustice, right? So uh, there, there, there are issues that we need to address, economic justice uh, and racial capitalism that cannot be understood in the language of race alone, right? Uh, but require other languages, other discourses uh, that are not about identity, that are indeed aren't even about subjects, but are about social structure and institutions. And the challenges I see it um, uh, for critical race theory in this particular moment uh, is to follow through uh, with the impulses uh, that have uh, led us to talk in a much more rigorous and expansive way uh, than uh, we did in the early 90s about institutional racism, right? about structural racism, right? um, given uh, the sheer taken for grantedness and ubiquity of the notion that identity exhausts the whole field of social existence and of political uh, action. So I'm going to uh, say um, thank you. I've gone on for a while. Um, <laughs> Brilliant. Uh, and um, look forward to uh, yeah. the conversation. Thank you, Kendall. That was that was brilliant, particularly the way in which you mapped the kind of the the, the historical situation and emergence of uh, critical race theory in the '90s and the different ways in which we are in this moment dealing with uh, the issues uh, surrounding racial justice. So uh, that was extraordinary. I want to pick up on the questions of identity politics. Um, and I think, I, I think I, I'd like to raise three areas, three questions possibly. Um, the first having to do with the notion that was, very, that was central to critical race theory in the 90s, which was this notion of anti-essentialism, right? Um, which was very present in the work. In other words, the work on identity was conjoined, joined at the hip with this notion of anti-essentialism. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and so the first area I wanna explore or I wanna ask is in, in, why, does, why would that uh, framework of anti-essentialism not be adequate anymore? Is it not adequate or was it not adequate or why couldn't we think of an identity politics conjoined with an anti-essentialism? So you'll remember, I mean, of course, I mean, you, you, you wrote so much about these questions of a critique of essentialism, of what you called black racialism in, uh, in the introduction to key writings and in other places. Uh, it was, there was a critique of, on the one hand, there was a, the critique of the crude essentialism that um, uh, uh, was targeted particularly uh, to uh, the debates over Clarence Thomas uh, and the nomination of Clarence Thomas, and you know whether uh, uh, whether um, we would uh, kind of essentialize the views there. Um, you were you were also rejecting at the time a notion of the the vulgar anti essentialism, which you were referring to earlier today uh, this evening about critical legal studies believing that because the category of race is not, you know, is socially constructed, then we can do without it. Um, but to, 
put all of those strands together, uh, there was this strong argument that you had to conjoin uh, an anti-essentialist account of the processes. This was from the introduction, right? Mm-hmm. The processes by which law participates in racing American society. And of course, um, you also find that anti-essentialism in, in, in Hall, in, in Marable. Marable, for instance, in the Third Reconstruction has this idea of an anti-essentialist sorting because there's a sorting of African-Americans as between the more assimilationist and the more separatist thinkers and actors and et cetera. Um, so, so, so the first thing I wanted to ask you is whether or not those principles and those ideas of not thinking about things in essential terms, binary terms, um, could be a way to help us think about these questions of identity politics today, or is that, or is it just, or did it like, it didn't, it didn't, hold up um, or, and, and could it? Then the second thing that I think about in this context of identity politics is um, this notion that we find in Stuart Hall in a way of, of, of undoing racial identity, transforming racial identity. Um, in, 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 we might use the word queering uh, racial identity, right? Um, so all of the issues surrounding the way in which identities themselves can be undone. And, then, and, and, and the question here is whether that framework works as well in the racial identity context as it might elsewhere, for instance, in gender or sexuality. Um, so Stuart Hall in... Uh, so in those lectures, the fateful triangle. So we've had many discussions, Kendall, and <laughs> that was one of them that we we had, we, we had talked about that those, those set of lectures. Um, uh, there's this passage in there where Stuart Hall is talking specifically about the way in which there's he says there's no way of preventing culture from slipping and sliding, right? And hence, and then he writes. There is no way of limiting or trying to fix the varieties of subjects that black people will become, right? And so there's this notion of uh, malleability of of the way in which with a sliding signifier, uh, there is in his words, no way to limit the varieties of identity that the black experience will come to include. And of course, a lot of his work uh, and we saw it in the article that we read for today on uh, culture resistance and struggle. Um, it's also in those lectures uh, from uh, Harvard from 1994. He really is exploring the way in which I- identity can be reclaimed, resignified. Um, he, in those contexts, he's particularly interested in the ways in which kind of Caribbean and South Asian persons who had immigrated to the UK were able to redeploy and resignify the identity of black uh, in order to turn it into kind of a form of solidarity. Mm-hmm. Uh, and this was true for you know, Sikhs and Hindu and others from uh, the Indian subcontinent, as well as Jamaicans mm-hmm. and Barbadians and Trinidadians mm-hmm. and others from the Caribbean. So, so the second, so, so the first question was about whether anti-essentialism could do the work. The second question is whether we could hold on to and work with notions of identity, but uh, being very attuned to the potentials for resignification, the potentials for undoing, right? The potentials for D, what Foucault called de-subjectification in a way. Of course, that was what was, that was what Foucault was so particularly interested in uh, and what he found in authors like Nietzsche and Bataille and Blanchot. And originally, actually, this all started when he was working with uh, phenomenologists and existential psychiatry. But the idea of uh, looking at the subject phenomenologically in a way in order to then, um, from that experience, um, to be able to tear yourself away from your own subjectivity or to tear the subject away from their identity in a way. Um, that's what he 
found so helpful in Nietzsche. He said uh, he was, he wrote about that it can lead to the task of tearing the subject from itself in such a way that it is no longer the subject as such, or that it is completely other than itself, so that it may arrive at its annihilation, its disassociation. That's what he found so interesting in that de subject subjectifying undertaking, um, which were the way in which experiences, in his words, could tear me from myself to prevent me from always being the same. Now, so the question here is whether we retain um, a, a, a theory of identity, but um, infuse it with these uh, more labile ways of resignifying and rethinking, resignifying identity. And, and, and of course, a big question here is whether racial identity can be subject to that as in the same way as gender or sexuality. Um, and, and here there, it, may, it may not, right? Um, and, then so, and then the third thing this makes me think about is kind of where you were ending yourself in terms of Stuart Hall's, um, the way in which he himself was willing to stick with difficult, very problematic concepts, even of race as biology. That's where so, so many of his provocative statements arise in the context of discussing race. Um, the way in which, even though we all know there is no truth to race as biology, the way it sticks in the discourse and stays here, and therefore the way in which we need to uh, find a way to, to deal with it. Um, so there's this, there's this passage, and of course, this is, this is precisely where he's talking about uh, discursive uh, operations, right? He's talking about racist biology. He says, I do nevertheless want to advance the scandalous argument that socially, historically, and politically race is a discourse that it operates like a language, like a sliding signifier, that it's signifiers reference not genetically established facts, but the systems of meaning that have come to be fixed in the classifications of culture, right? So, so I think the, the third question would be on this question of identity politics, even though it is kind of being deployed most aggressively and problematically now uh, by the right? Um, is it in a way inevitable, right? That it, 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 it's, it's, it's going to have this discursive function. And so it's not as if we can uh, discard it. It's not as if we can do without a theory of identity. Um, it's a question of uh, trying to uh, change the discursive practices themselves. Um, so, so, those are, so those are three thoughts, I think, on this question, which I think is today the most important one uh, in this context of critical race theory today. Mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, those are all, those are all um, great uh, questions. Thank you so much uh, for formulating them. Um, in such a focused and forceful way. Um, I am tempted to start with the third question and just say that um, I would like to draw a distinction, which I think I take directly from uh, Stuart Hall himself between identity politics and examination of and engagement with the question of the politics of identity. Right? Uh, and um, he writes uh, somewhere, the recognition of the impossibility of identity in its fully unified meaning does of course transform our sense of what identity politics is about. 
it transforms the nature of political commitment. 101% commitment is no longer possible. Uh, looking at new conceptions of identity requires us also to look at redefinitions of the forms of politics which follow uh, that. And this is not a politics of identity, and this is a term I have not used, but which is crucially important uh, to Stuart Hall's theoretical work. Uh, looking at new conceptions of identity requires us also to look at redefinitions of the forms of politics which follow that. The politics of difference, the politics of self-reflexivity, a politics that is open to contingency, but still able to act. Right? Um, now, he, he is offering, it seems to me, with these three, three categories, a politics of difference, a politics of, of self-reflexivity, and a, a politics of contingency uh, that does not refuse or deny the relevance of identity right? uh, or seek to shut down a conversation about the politics of identity, but rather offers us a set of terms for approaching and investigating and interrogating this question of the political meanings and valence and register and effects of identity that are not reducible to the politics of identity, that are not reducible to rather to identity politics of, as we have come to know it. So that for me is an, a very important conceptual distinction. The, 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 the case here is not against uh, in understanding and engaging with the political, uh, 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 with, with identity as a political question, right? uh, but rather is about uh, questioning the value, indeed the possibility Right? of an identity politics that emerges from and authorizes a single hegemonic identity, right? And that I wanna say can take place even when that single hegemonic identity uh, purports to be, uh, to use uh, uh, um, a hegemonic term, <laughs> uh, at least in some circles, intersectional, right? right? Um, and so I wanna go from this question to the first question uh, and your observations about the prominence in the early nineties of a critique of anti-essentialism. Um, and that was work um, that was very important and which represented you know, an effort to bring into uh, the discussion of race, the kinds of theoretical and political uh, debates that originated in feminism and in uh, specifically in the black challenge to feminism, but which found the language of anti-essentialism in fact, um, through the epistemic uh, 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 um, explorations of uh, post-structuralism, but also through queer theory, right? Uh, I'm thinking here of, you know, uh, well, I don't need to name uh, the people who were doing this work in the early 90s. 
And uh, in many ways, the subsequent history of and the disappearance uh, of the critique of essentialism as a central uh, methodological plank and part of the, uh, the ongoing uh, program of critical race theory, is sort of the path not taken, right? Uh, because I think there were some people who thought that um, if you were anti-essentialist, or at least radically and rigorously anti-essentialist, you couldn't say anything and you couldn't do anything, right? So uh, we thus had uh, the, the idea um, that Gaichi Spivak came up with of a kind of strategic uh, essentialism, okay? Um, and the deployment of strategies of identitarian uh, claims making, right? that would authorize practical, pragmatic, political uh, interventions and um, enable uh, social change that a thoroughgoing anti-essentialism that you know, went all the way down uh, could not. And I think there were, you know, there were, there were, there were some confusions actually, because in fact, you know, we were reading at the same time the work of Richard Rorty and, and uh, you know, this anti-foundationalist pragmatic uh, account, which is very different than the anti-essentialist account, um, uh, which was not about uh, refusing uh, to engage in uh, propositional claims making in the in the arena of, of, of politics, or to use the I word, um, but we're about recognizing that any claim uh, uttered uh, in the field of politics uh, was a claim that was true for us, right? And did not depend on its efficacy in a particular situation, that is to say our situation, on our ability to claim that it was true for all people at all times, everywhere, right? Uh, and, and that refusal of a kind of uh, um, universalism um, under in 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 in, a, in the kind of anti-financialist uh, pragmatism of Richard Rorty was not debilitating or disenabling or disabling rather, uh, but it was it was about a, a recognition that you know um, we engage in politics from a position uh, in a in a specific situation, and that uh, the legitimation either of our claims making or of our action. Uh, from those positions and in those situations are in no way uh, to be subjected to a principle of trans historical universality. Right? Uh, so I think there was, there was some misunderstanding of what uh, was at stake uh, in anti-essentialism, uh, which for me at base, and this is what queer theory about, is about and, and a queer politics is about, is about embracing uh, what Foucault himself called the politics of discomfort. And I think, I think uh, it, it, the, the idea of anti-essentialism just made some people uh, too uncomfortable and the emergence of the language of identity uh, seemed to be doing uh, both analytic and practical political work uh, that they were willing, unwilling rather, to uh, give up. And so uh, the, the, the notion of intersectionality comes in, uh, which is about an articulation of, uh, of identities uh, in and through one another, which is uh, uh, certainly an improvement on the notion of a single hegemonic identity, uh, but it still doesn't disturb the idea of the solidity 
and the stolidity of identity as such, right? Uh, there was an alternative, which wouldn't necessarily have had to come uh, from uh, queer theory or from the critique of uh, anti-essentialism and feminism that you know, interrogated the, the notion of a universal uh, category or lived experience of uh, the feminine, right? And that was a notion and, and um, it had a profound impact on, um, uh, on black intellectuals in the so-called uh, Anglophone world, as well as in the Francophone world. And that is the notion of hybridity, which someone like Edouard Glissant uh, developed richly as a notion of creolization. So this is uh, this is uh, this is uh, Hall writing about um, the uses of um, a chain of terms right, that start with hybridity, right, but also include. Uh, such terms uh, that start with difference rather, but then also includes uh, other terms like hybridity, uh, diversity, and indeed diaspora, right? Uh, he writes in this essay that I read from at the beginning uh, of my remarks on cultural identity and diaspora, uh, that Afro-Caribbean people are already people of a diaspora. I use this term here metaphorically, not literally, Diaspora does not refer us to those scattered tribes whose identity can only be secured in relation to some sacred homeland to which they must at all costs return, even if it means pushing other people into the sea. This is the old, the imperializing, uh, the hegemonizing form of ethnicity. We have seen the fate of the people of Palestine at the hands of this backward looking conception of diaspora and the complicity of the West with it. The diaspora experience as I intended here is defined not by essence or purity, but by the recognition of a necessary heterogeneity and diversity, by conception of identity, and he puts it in scare quotes here, which lives with and through, not despite difference. Diaspora identities are those which are constantly producing and reproducing themselves anew through transformation and difference. Right? One can only think here of what is uniquely, essentially Caribbean, precisely the mixes of color, pigmentation, physiognomic type, the blends of tastes that is Caribbean culture, the aesthetics of crossovers of cut and mix, uh, to borrow Dick Hebdiga's telling phrase, which is the heart and soul of black music. Young black cultural practitioners and critics in Britain are increasingly coming to acknowledge and explore in their work, this diaspora aesthetic and its formations in the post-colonial experience. So what I wanna say here um, is, and you know, this is a very tentative idea, uh, this fear of a thoroughgoing radical anti-foundationalism has something to do, and I, I, I can't specify it um, out loud right now, and I'm, I'm quite literally uh, thinking, uh, uh, thinking out loud, has something to do um, with the ways in which critical race theory uh, notwithstanding the influences of these, these uh, scholarship ideas and, and cultural practices from elsewhere uh, bears the mark of what uh, Hall calls in the fateful triangle, the national signifier. And so um, I, I take up these questions in, in the last paragraph uh, of an essay that I published a couple of years ago 
in Difference is called Is Black Marriage Queer? Um, and it's an essay in which I use Ryan Coogler's film, uh, Black Panther, uh, to raise a set of questions about um, the, the white mythology, as I put it, of a closed Americanist narrative um, about race. And um, I think that, you know, thinking the question of the Black Atlantic, uh, of the Black American, and of what Stuart Hall, uh, I'm sorry, of what Paul Gilroy has so um, productively uh, theorized as the Black Atlantic together in a way that, situations, that situates questions of race and racial discourse in a broader diasporic frame is the next task of critical race theory. I think the lat crits are trying to do some of this, but it's not simply about transnationality. It's about thinking diasporically, right? Um, across borders or without borders, um, um, using this notion of difference um, as a way of uh, not only uh, recognizing that what we call race operates as a mobile uh, modality in which other identities and categories, such as class, religion, gender, sexuality, ethnicity, nationality, region, and language are lived and governed and regulated. It's, it's also, it seems to me, um, uh, uh, an opportunity and a challenge um, to see that race and racism do what they do at different times and in different places through complex labile articulations that produce unpredictable consequences and unstable, uncanny, and even queer effects. So this opening up of race and with it uh, of gender and sexuality into Alia beyond the national signifier is I think only going to be possible by returning to the queering <laughs> of race that animated uh, the anti-essentialist uh, impulse. Um, and that tries to understand what uh, uh, Hall in this essay on cultural identity and uh, diaspora uh, tries to capture through uh, the, uh, an understanding of identity uh, as a matter of becoming as well as of being, right? An understanding of identity is something that belongs to the future, which is not yet arrived as much as to the past uh, as something which I'm reading Hall here, which uh, does not already exist uh, and that uh, does not transcend place, time, history, and culture, but which is historical and is undergoing constant uh, transformation, right? So um, the, the move to intersectionality, which was so important and generative um, in so many ways, um, has come to be a kind of um, essentialism 2.0, right? Which is essentialized identity by virtue of um, a refusal uh, to embrace a deep uh, and thoroughgoing uh, approach to identity as constituted in and through difference. Uh, so for example, um, we think about and talk about intersectionality today as though it is a synonym uh, in the first instance for women, right? And then for other uh, uh, gender or sexual minorities, right? Uh, but in fact, all identities are intersectional, right? Uh, but because we're dealing here uh, with a way in which these questions of identity are not just external, right? Uh, and not just a product of our responding to uh, an oppression and othering that comes from outside, but our internal, right? There are internal struggles going on among people of color um, that are <laughs> not just about this move from the margin to the center, but about who will occupy the center, right? Uh, that's why, for example, you know, I have deep, uh, problems with the idea that we can uh, or ought to try to understand the deep, the, 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 the structuring logic um, and continuing presence 
of white supremacy and racism in the United States by centering the experience of people of African descent and slavery? What about genocide uh, and the extermination of the indigenous people who were here before the Africans uh, were brought in chains to these shores? You know, what is lost uh, when we center uh, slavery right? uh, and anti-Black racism as the absolute core, the heart uh, of the American dilemma today? There's an erasure of violence even um, that takes place there that is both intellectually um, and in practical political terms, um, uh, scandalously right? uh, inadequate right? uh, and ultimately disempowering. Right? So, you know, the Sumi Cho has written um, in response to uh, the critiques of Darren Hutchinson and Athena Matu and others saying that we should work with an idea of multidimensionality rather than of intersectionality, that this resistance to intersectionality has something to do with the reluctance or refusal to accept and embrace a, a theory of a, a critical theory of race uh, developed by and that centers the experience of black women. But the whole heart of the anti-essentialist, anti-foundationalist politics, and perhaps um, a textbook definition of a politics of an anti-racist politics of discomfort would for me be one uh, it, it would take the Lefortian move, and here I'm, I'm talking about Claude Lefort, in which, you know, uh, an emancipatory politics is a politics that rejects the logic of uh, progress as a movement from the margin to the center and rejects uh, uh, in favor of a notion of no center at all, or at least a center that cannot be occupied by any one of these identities uh, in which and through which races live, right? So that's not just an anti-essentialist, anti it's an anti-foundationalist politics um, in which identity is always already understood to be constituted. And this is the, the chief insight of post-structuralism. Identity is always already understood to be constituted in and through difference. And that scares the bejesus out of us. Right? Because we think that we cannot authorize right, um, a persuasive claim about the injustice of social practices without you know, this appeal to the authenticity of the location from which I'm making this claim as a gay Black man or you know, as a, 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 a non-cisgender uh, um, uh, uh, queer uh, gender queer, uh, uh, disabled, um, non bi right? You know, the, 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 the identities, you know, there's a reason why the chain of identities has grown longer and longer with time. Uh, but the lesson we should be taking from that is not, perhaps, I'm going to pose this as a question, <laughs> that we ought to, that we ought to lengthen the chain, right? Uh, but rather think about, um, putting the chain down, right? So um, Paisley Cura in the Transgender Rights Volume to which I contributed some years ago, wrote brilliantly. Uh, he described uh, transgender politics as a politics uh, that is organized around a, a category, a social category that seeks its own dissolution, right? Mm. Um, now, I think the residual biologism that attaches to race, curiously, in a way that isn't even true in some ways of, of sex gender, right? Um, just, you know, and this is a, this is, this is a political problem, um, but it's also a psychic problem, right? Uh, it, it, it's, about, it's about the anxiety of letting go, right? Um, and, uh, uh, um, entering a domain where we cannot uh, predict in advance, right? Um, that there will be a connection between um, 
well, where we cannot predict, let me just say, where we cannot predict the outcome in advance. So hybridity, creolization, identity as difference, self-reflexivity, contingency, that's Stuart Hall, right? And, and it's not about giving up identity, it's about giving up identity politics, right? And that, that it seems to me is a really important uh, distinction. And it has to do, um, this is the second question, with a kind of queering, right? Mm -hmm. uh, with a kind of queering of race mm -hmm. uh, that we haven't uh, been willing to do in, in part uh, because I think even some of the most progressive of us uh, are still invested in a certain kind of politics of, of respectability, at least within the Black community, right? Mm -hmm. um, given the anxieties uh, that attend the idea um, that um, the struggle for racial justice is joined at the hip uh, to uh, the disreputable struggles, say, of trans, um, non-binary um, sex workers, right? Um, and uh, that, it seems to me, is the politics of discomfort that I want to get behind, and which I think uh, creolization, hybridity, self-reflexivity, and contingency right? Uh, all of which Paul says are aspects of uh, not identity politics, not identity politics, but the politics of identity make possible. Thank you, Kendall. Um, so let me, let me just invite everyone to start turning on uh, their videos and maybe we can uh, uh, have everybody uh, start to join the, the conversation. Um, and I'm, I'm going to start with uh, Amina Hassan Birdwell, who has a question before, before, so as you're turning on your videos and, and, and turning on your audios and stuff, I would say, I mean, just a quick thought, Kendall, I think, I think elongating the chain is important, um, but it's a, it's a question of, it's a question of without, without centering in some sense. I think that the, the Le, Le Fordian, uh, um, paradigm that you have in mind is one that allows for that, um, but that just tries to avoid the, the inherent problems with the centering, which is something that, that all of this discourse in some way is trying to avoid, right? Um, but um, but uh, there's something about I prefer, I prefer a web. I prefer a web oh, to okay. a chain. Oh, okay. Right? Okay. All right. Okay. If we're going to okay. choose that a works. metaphor. Okay. Right? Okay. Right. Okay. Right. Okay. Good, good, good. Um, uh, Amina Hassan Birdwell, thanks for joining us. Uh, you're out in Stanford now, right? Uh, still in Los Angeles. In Los Angeles. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Good, um, good. Thank you, uh, Dr. Thomas. That was wonderful. The clarity you gave to the project of critical race theory and where it stands now was just excellent and very helpful. Um, I just have two quick questions. Um, I'm thinking of a way to propose the second one, but the first one is if you would comment on Afro-pessimism and um, discussions about that in terms of this kind of widening the scope of discussions and identity. And the second question, and forgive me if I don't frame this right, um, is one of capitalism and like liberalism and the kind of limitations it poses on not only the expanding of the web of identity, but the kind of transnational discussions um, and kind of even explicating histories, um, transnational histories and recoveries um, and uh, I guess the angle that I'm concerned about is that, you know, the, the kind of discussion or, or the kind of function of capitalism is this view of scarcity that is sometimes real, a lot of times real and sometimes imaginative and how that can create blockages um, in kind of meeting one across distance or seeing yourself across distances instead of the centered um, uh, uh, space that the destabilizing space doesn't turn into a closure um, if we can how do we think outside of one's interest or um, one's needs either of a community or one that is surrounds an identity or can come out 
of uh, different engagements of different forms of identity? Um, how, how do we navigate uh, the kind of the, the, the view of scarcity and the competing of self-interest that kind of come out of a capitalist system in view of it? Um, and does this webbing in which you're describing create kind of like to use a Derridian word, an autoimmunity um, towards, towards, towards capitalism? That's just it. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Great, there's so much there. Um, uh, Afro-pessimism, I, I, I think there's a lot of power um, in uh, the analysis of Afro-pessimism. Uh, where I get confused about Afro-pessimism is whether and if so, to what extent um, it is a philosophical analysis uh, that is rooted in, epist in an epist a conceptual claim, which is rooted in epistemology or an interpretive um, uh, account that is rooted in history, right? Um, I also think that um, it is vulnerable to the criticism that I made earlier about uh, not just the priority, but the primacy that it accords to um, the realities, and they are realities, of anti-Blackness as a structuring principle um, in um, American life, since that's most of its focus, but perhaps uh, uh, more broadly, um, Western life as a whole. Um, I think that this idea that uh, Blackness in the United States and perhaps more broadly in the West uh, is connected to and represents in Sadia Hartman's formulation, accumulation and fungibility, that is um, a condition of, an expression of, a site of ontological death, right? Um, and not of cultural identity is important. Um, and I think it is directly related to the point that you wanted to make about racial capitalism, about capitalism, right? Because for me, um, you know, there's some people who've argued um, Michael Dawson won that we should that we should be we should be that maybe we, we shouldn't use this phrase racial capitalism that we should talk about race and capitalism, but I think actually existing capitalism, um, certainly global capitalism today as we know it is a racial capitalism. Whether we're talking about China and Africa uh, or uh, 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 the history of slavery in the United States. And I think that the notion of racial capitalism helps us understand uh, aspects of uh, the black condition uh, in particular uh, that cannot be understood any other way. I'm writing a piece right now um, that I'm almost done with that is a response to uh, my colleague, Katerina Pistor's brilliant book, The Code of Capital, uh, in which I argue against her notion that you can, you can, you can offer an account of the way law codes capital uh, without resort to class identities. Um, I argue that even if that is true and or desirable, you certainly can't do that uh, without an investigation of um, racialized identities, right? Because race is central to the constitution of capitalism in the United States. Uh, there would be no capitalism as we know it uh, in the United States um, without the history of uh, slavery. And the afterlife of slavery as an economic institution, right? Um, the extraction, exploitation, and literal extinction of black bodies. Notice, uh, I'm not leaning to a notion of identity, but into a notion of bodies, um, can be seen in uh, the story that you could tell about the murders of Eric Garner and George Floyd as stories about racial capitalism, right? Uh, Eric Garner was trying to sell loose cigarettes. He was behaving entrepreneurially in a black market, which is the only market open to so many black men, 
um, which is not why they call it the black market, but it has a special resonance, right? Um, uh, George Floyd was accused of trying to pass a counterfeit uh, uh, bill, right? So the they were they they became objects of anti-black violence in the marketplace, right? And by virtue of uh, economic activity in uh, the, the the economic possibilities open to them under racial capitalism, right? And so I think it is crucially important. Uh, and you know Athena Matua, Anthony Farley, uh, and several other folks associated with critical uh, race theory have tried to argue for uh, the importance of uh, attending in a way that critical race theory in its first two generations really did not uh, to the question of capitalism uh, and to the understanding of racial capitalism um, uh, that uh, is most powerfully uh, developed by Cedric Robinson in black Marxism. So I wanna endorse that. And I also wanna say um, that I think there's much that is valuable um, in Afro-pessimism because it centers the question of death in a way that converges for me uh, in a powerful way uh, with the insight of uh, my constitutional law professor, the late Robert Cover, uh, into the necropolitical character of law when he wrote that legal interpretation takes place in a field of pain and death, right? And so the necropolitical logics of capitalism, uh, which are not about accumulation, uh, but which are about divestment, uh, disaccumulation, extraction, exploitation, and indeed extinction of black bodies as a structuring feature of capitalism and of American social life more broadly um, are insights that we ought not uh, 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 lose sight of. Thanks, Kendall, and thanks, Amina, for those great questions. Um, I think that uh, maybe we'll go with a quick round of a few uh, interventions. I know that, uh, first of all, we do have people who are on very different time zones. So if you want to jump in first, I don't know, Sarah, you're in Frankfurt, Tuomo, you're in Finland. Um, Basuli Deb has a question. So, and, and, so if you want to, do you want to jump in now? Sarah? Yeah? Yeah, yeah, thank you. Okay, okay. Yeah, <laughs> yeah in Frankfurt, it's like uh, uh, t nearly two o'clock uh, in yeah, the night. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, yeah, and thank you very much for the very um, inspiring uh, discussion and talk. And um, I was thinking about um, how identity politics and um, um, anti racial politics could fit together or to what extent not. And I really was interested in the um, second feature that Bernard introduced that the Nietzschean Foucauldian path of trying to um, de-subjectivate um, oneself from oneself and from the context in which one lives things and feels. And I was thinking when one has already the mind that is decolonized, how one can do this process. So one, I'm trying to search for something like in dialectics of identity or dialectics of, um, of, of living, feeling and thinking because one cannot get rid of uh, in the context in which one lives, but one has to try to get rid of it. So that was my question. Thanks, Sarah. Tuomo, do you want to jump in? You're also uh, off on yes. a different time yeah. zone. Yes, please. I'm, I'm even one hour uh, <clears throat> further ahead. And that, that was the reason I was hesitant to, to turn my camera initially. But, uh, so uh, I'll, I'll try to be quick. Um, so, so, I mean, it was very illuminating to me to, to hear about the history of critical race theory. So I'm coming to this conversation from slightly different disciplinary background as a philosopher. So there, there is a lot that I'm uh, pretty ignorant about. Um, and the constellation between uh, kind of classical liberalism, kind of neo-Marxist class reductionism, and then critical race theory as a challenger to these two approaches, 
that um, <clears throat> you laid out was was extremely uh, helpful, but also intriguing intriguing to me because this this is the setup that that you see if you watch uh, Tucker Carlson tonight, for for example, today. So uh, it, like we're talking about culture and we're talking about power. And it's striking to me how it, it is these uh, two theoretical alternatives that people like Tucker Carlson uh, resort to in the criticism of critical race theory, uh, you know, on a, on a daily basis on American primetime TV. So it's the it's the class. It's, it's a class stupid, not race, or we are all just, we're all just free individuals and we don't have to. I mean, we should be colorblind because of that. So uh, um, I would like to hear your thoughts on, well, I guess meaning, meaning and power which are of course uh, interconnected, but how, what, what would be required to change uh, this, this constellation so that uh, at least aspects of liberalism and aspects of uh, Marxist class analysis that both have, I think, uh, healthy, important, elements in them could be actually allies of critical race theory instead of being deployed against it. So I kind of just what would have to happen in terms of the meanings and also in terms of relations of power? I mean, I know it's a big, it's a big question, but I'm, any, any thoughts on that would be extremely interesting. Thank you. Great, thanks. Um, Basuli, do you want to jump in quickly? Okay. Um, thank you for problematizing the binary logic of race. I think that also problematizing the, um, homo um, the, ho uh, the homogenizing concept of people of color. So I really appreciated that. Now, this is my, the question which starts with a um, call for papers. I'm just going to read it out from what I've written. National Women's Studies Association just uh, sent out a call for papers asking the membership to quote unquote fit in with a CRT framework um, in their proposal submissions for a conference. Now, going back to your reference to CRT's association with legal feminism, what avenues would a feminist scholar have within a CRT frame in attempting to address the play of power in anti-Asian xenophobia and racism, particularly in the context of attacks against Asian women from across the color line, as National Women's Studies is suggesting to, members, to the membership. How do we queer race in this context? And I completely understand how you're framing it, but that's not the existing, that you're, you're thinking about how to not fall into these traps, but uh, national associations are sending out these calls within a very, um, you know, um, a kind of binary logic of white and black and asking everyone else to fit into within that. Then how do we address these when there are distinctly, you know, attacks on women by men of color, which we are seeing in, uh, and, you know, I mean, across the color line, as I said, what avenues do we have there? Okay. All right, that's, that's, that's a lot, uh, Kendall, and we are uh, getting close to uh, our, the, the end of our session, but uh, so let me ask you to maybe address some of those uh, or as much as you'd like. Okay, um, I should have written down the questions better. Um, I, I was taking some notes, but you know, one thing I would say, um, Stuart Hall famously wrote in an article um, right after Margaret Thatcher was elected, I guess, uh, to office for the third time, uh, that the left in England had failed uh, to understand that politics is not a matter of interest 
or rational uh, calculation and choice, but that the way people imagine themselves is a crucial ingredient of politics. And Jacqueline Rose, in a brilliant essay on Ruth Ellis, who was the last woman executed uh, in England, and Margaret Thatcher in her uh, collection, 1993 collection, Why War, uh, Why War uh, uses that to really talk about the relationship of women to violence, not as victims, but as purveyors of violence. And I wrote a little piece uh, many years ago, which I sh should go back to and actually finish because um, it, it appeared in, in super truncated form on Condole Condoleezza Rice and Wanda Jean Allen. Um, Condoleezza Rice, as you all know, was a national security advisor, uh, later Secretary of State under George Bush II. Uh, um, uh, and and uh, Condoleezza Rice was a Black, uh, intellectually disabled um, lesbian who was executed uh, in um, Oklahoma shortly after George, uh, George Bush uh, took office for killing her lover. and. Um, this question of the imagination and the way people imagine themselves is really, um, for me, a productive site of, of the work that critical race theory, um, with very few exceptions, I think, for example, of the work of my colleague, uh, Patricia Williams has shied away from. In thinking about uh, the question of subject position, not just um, in rational, uh, interest-based terms, but thinking in terms of um, uh, subject position and the psychic life of power, of racial power, right? Um, and uh, uh, of interiority and the ways in which, you know, uh, the racial subject, like all subjects, is a split subject, right? Um, and that the insight uh, that W.B. Du Bois made many years ago about the double consciousness of African Americans um, um, in our age um, needs to be pluralized, right? Uh, we're talking about multiple warring cells that inhabit the Black American uh, uh, body in particular, but, you know, um, um, the body of anyone who's racialized in these United States. Um, in the year 2022. 20, uh, and so this question of what uh, might be called um, the political unconscious is one reason why I think even if we let go of uh, identity politics as we know it, we cannot and ought not try to let go of the interrogation of the politics of identity uh, in the terms in which uh, Stuart Hall undertook uh, that work. And so, um, you know, um, I think we need to recognize the limits of an identity politics, not least because it forces us to confront the ways in which identity is an elsewhere and an alibi for avoiding uh, uh, really wrestling with the psychic life of racial power mm -hmm. and the ways in which uh, the operations of uh, that um, uh, politics constitute what Gajdu Spivak many years ago called uh, a, a kind of resident alterity, right? Uh, that uh, um, inhabits uh, the bodies of, of those who are seeking uh, uh, justice and um, struggling for freedom in ways uh, that are real, um, um, terrifying, uh, but which absolutely have to be reckoned with as part of our collective uh, struggle. On the question of, um, um, I think the, the second question, Lonnie Guineer, um, may she rest in power. Many years ago, I don't know that it ever appeared in print, offered a formulation uh, that I found very productive. She said that, you know, um, we have an opportunity, uh, and this was at the height of identity politics, to move from interest, which we've done, an interest group, pluralistic understanding of American politics um, to identity and from identity to a politics of solidarity. And I think the notion of political race that she and uh, uh, Gerald Torres so beautifully elaborate in The Miner's Canary, their 2002 book, um, is a conception of uh, race 
that is coalitional right? and locational right? um, and which allows for the constitution of racial publics without resort to identity. And uh, I don't know if they use this example, but I remember in the eighties, and one of the things that took me to like reading race in class was uh, when I learned uh, that uh, South Asians in England who were allied with uh, Afro-Caribbeans and uh, African uh, uh, residents, Afro-British uh, residents of the UK were calling themselves black, right? right? That it seemed to me was a moment um, in which precisely like this moment queer, Bernard, right? In which black was uh, nominalized to name a situation of people who were phenotypically, ethnically uh, different and diverse and um, um, heterogeneous, but who came together around a shared political conception of race, which no one body right, or group of bodies inhabited the center of. Right? And that I think is a de-reifying utopian, but also quite pragmatic and concrete deployment of the idea of race. Uh, the, of, of political race that I would offer up uh, as an example. And it is rooted in a politics of solidarity uh, that is not the same as the politics of interest, the liberal politics of interest on one side or the politics of identity uh, on the other. And uh, with that, I think I'm going to shut up. Sorry, excellent. Uh, thank you so much, Kendall. I, I, we have uh, gone over already, and so I'm going to have to apologize to others who have questions. Uh, Kendall, I've been also staring at this image you you sent me. Um, and oh I yes, I wanted. If you I, I, wanted I, if, right, you, I'd wanted to start with this image, okay, which seems so to me I'm to be uh, me, from the me. realm of culture a beautiful representation of why uh, we need to let go of identity politics. This is identity politics uh, as commodity, right? Um, we do not have the terms to understand or critically interpret this image um, within an internal right, uh, rhetoric of identity politics, right? We just don't, we just don't. Um, and so, this is the problem. This is a visual representation of, of the problem or one of the problems uh, that I think identity politics today uh, confronts us with uh, that demands uh, that, you know, let critical race theory be critical, right? James Baldwin fam famously said many years ago, because I love America more than any other country, I reserve my right to criticize her perpetually, right? And um, uh, I want to argue for, if not permanent revolution, uh, the practice of critical race theory as a permanent critique, right? Um, uh, in which race is criticized, power is criticized, identity is, is criticized, all of the constituent components of the theory in a self-reflexive move are subjected to the kind of critical spirit and critical procedures that it turns outward on uh, practices of racism and racialization. That it seems to me um, is the dialectical dimension of critical race theory that um, is more important now uh, than it has ever been. And which um, I think uh, is part of its important uh, uh, part of the important work uh, that it must take up and continue to do at this most vexing uh, and to my mind, terrifying uh, chapter in American history in which we are literally on the brink of a new racial fascism, right? Um, and the stakes could not be greater. Thank you. Kendall, thank you so much. Uh, that was amazing, so rich, so helpful. And the idea, yes, the idea that everything is open to our critique 
right, is, um, is the perfect way to end this conversation. Um, thank you, Kendall. Uh, thank you, uh, Fonda. Thank you, everyone. And, um, and uh, I will see you next in um, February uh, when we tackle uh, what I'll call prison writings. Okay. Mm. Take care. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you all. Thank you. Thank you.